Thank you for inviting me to talk about my grandfather, E. Stanley Jones. For more than half a century, Jones proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ and applied it to personal, social, national, and international problems as they arose on every continent and among all cultures. Jones was probably the world's best known and longest tested Christian missionary and evangelist of his day. Masses knew him as a global missionary, evangelist, author, and follower of Jesus, and his ministry continues to provide a strong base for Christian work today. Let me first tell you a bit about his early years and how he arrived at what was to be his life's work as an evangelist for Jesus Christ. He was born in 1884 in a rural community not far from Baltimore. By his own acknowledgement, his background was ordinary, appearance, education, and gifts, everything was quite ordinary. His autobiography tells us that as a teenager, he ran with a gang. However, despite his outer rebelliousness, my grandfather was receptive when a visiting evangelist spoke on what Christ meant to him and to the astonishment and annoyance of his young gang friends, my grandfather responded to the evangelist's call. Something extraordinary occurred that evening and a dramatic conversion changed his life. Jones spoke about two conversions. The first was what he called his horizontal change on the outside only. The authentic one, the vertical one came two years later, 1901. He was then radically and enduringly changed on the inside too. Conversion and surrender became the main themes of his life and ministry. E. Stanley Jones had planned to be a lawyer, but instead entered the ministry, first to Asbury College, then to missionary service in India, and to world renown as a witness to Jesus Christ. Jones went to India in 1907 at just 23 years of age. No orientation was given either for the country, its customs or climate, or even how to get around. He was given a one-way ship passage from New York City to Bombay, now Mumbai. While he was given the name of his ultimate destination, Lucknow, getting there was up to him. He tells the story of that 20-hour train ride to his final destination in the northern part of India. He found himself in a compartment with a well-educated English-speaking Muslim gentleman. Full of enthusiasm for his missionary work, he read this gentleman the Sermon on the Mount, expecting the man to be overwhelmed and immediately converted. Instead, the man said, we have the same thing in our sacred book. This was the first time my grandfather had come up against the very familiar, all religions are the same, only the paths are different attitude so widely held by many in the non-Christian world. It shook him for he wasn't prepared to deal with such attitudes, but it also made him face squarely at a really early point in his missionary career, the question about whether he was gonna argue or debate with non-Christians and try to prove them wrong and Christianity right or use some other way. He was led to consider another way, I think, a way that exclusively focused on Jesus. I think that this was a crucial decision which contributed to his great effectiveness. His first church was a British American Anglo Indian church in Lucknow and he was very successful in adding members to the church but felt a sense of constriction for the great masses of India were beyond his reach. Additionally, he felt uneasiness and alarm with what was happening in the Christian convert community. Too often in changing their faith, the new converts were also encouraged to take with their new faith a new foreign culture and essentially reject their identification with their Indian culture. Urging Indian Christians to remain truly indigenous was, I feel, a critical insight and one of my grandfather's important contributions to Christian missions. While E. Stanley Jones was a well-known evangelist, his wife, Mabel Lossing Jones, who lived to be 100, was an exceptional person in her own right. She was a gifted educator with a deep love for India and her people, as well as an uncommon resilience and level-headedness. 
Even as Mabel supported Stanley, Mabel had her own vision, a primary school for boys run completely by women. It was unheard of for women in India to teach boys in those days, but Mabel felt that small boys needed access to empathic and skilled female teachers in positions of authority. Even Mahatma Gandhi, who corresponded with Stanley and Mabel, commended her success in having women be teachers of young boys. A book about her teaching adventures in India entitled A Heart of Wisdom was recently published. Now an important story that will shape the rest of East Stanley Jones's life. It is now 1915, a year after my mother Eunice was born. Jones felt called to take his ministry to the intelligentsia of India, but felt insufficient to the task. To do so would mean standing down amid the currents of thought and national movements sweeping over India and interpreting Christ to that situation. He writes, and I quote, I was painfully conscious that I was not intellectually prepared for it. I was more painfully conscious that I was not Christian enough to do what the situation demanded. And most depressing of all, I was physically broken, end quote. Jones then took a year's furlough in 1915, returning to the United States. But when he got back to India, he found the break did not help. He feared that unless he got help from somewhere, he would have to go back to America, work on a farm and try to regain his health. It was one of his darkest hours. He writes, and I quote, at that time I was in a meeting in Lucknow. Now while in prayer, not particularly thinking about myself, a voice seemed to say to me, are you yourself ready for this work to which I've called you? I replied, no Lord, I'm done for. I have reached the end of my rope. The voice replied, if you will turn that over to me and not worry about it, I will take care of it. I quickly answered, Lord, I close the bargain right here. He continues, a great peace settled into my heart and pervaded me. I knew that it was done. The old trouble never returned. It was more than a physical touch. I seemed to have tapped new life for body, mind and spirit. Christ to me had become life. Apart from this healing, I question if I would have had the courage to answer the call to work among these leaders of India's thought and life. He then wrote, when I first went to India, I was trying to hold a very long line, a line that stretched from Genesis to Revelation onto Western civilization and to the Western Christian church, and even the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. I found myself bobbing up and down, seeing no well-defined issue. I had the ill-defined, but instinctive feeling that the heart of the matter was being left out. I saw that I could and should shorten my line, that I could take my stand at Christ and before that non-Christian world refused to know anything save Jesus Christ. I saw that the gospel lies in the person of Jesus and that he himself is the good news, that my one task was to live and to present him. My task was simplified, end quote. Thus began Stanley's great adventure throughout India. He was speaking constantly to ever-growing audiences of educated non-Christians. He presented Christ as a disentangled and universal Christ, belonging to all cultures and races and the answer to all human need. His first book, The Christ of the Indian Road, published in 1925, made this point clear. My grandfather had a unique approach for presenting Jesus. First of all, he held his lectures, they were not called sermons, in public halls, a neutral ground for non-Christians. They were in English, for all educated Indians spoke English. Prominent non-Christians were invited to proceed, pre preside, sorry. After the lecture, the next two hours were reserved for questions from the audience. With 50 to 200 lawyers in each meeting, the questions were always penetrating. And like my mother before me, for she also traveled with her father, I was appalled at the questions and certain that he could not answer them. They were really hard questions, but he did so with wisdom and graciousness 
so I could stop worrying about him. A more intimate approach to presenting Jesus to the non-Christian world was his round table conferences. Leading representatives of different faiths, including agnostics and atheists, maybe 30 to 40 people, were invited to share what their faith or lack of faith meant to them in experience. Jones would ask, tell us what you have found through your faith. What does it do for you in your everyday life? Jones writes, and I quote, in looking back at the round table approach, I see now how daring and decisive this approach was. Here we were putting our cards on the table and asking the non-Christian world to do the same. Suppose our hands with which we were playing the game of life should turn out to be inadequate. And suppose other ways of life should prove more adequate. This was a showdown and the stakes were high. In every situation, the trump card was Jesus Christ. He made the difference. The people who followed him might be spotty and inadequate, but they had hold of the spotless and adequate, or better still, Christ had hold of them. Present day dialogues with non-Christian faiths have been heralded as something new and they are surely important. E. Stanley Jones held these conversations 80 years ago. Out of the experience of public speaking and the roundtable conferences, my grandfather felt the need of a spiritual base, a place for spiritual refreshment, where there could be in-depth study and reflection in the company of a close-knit group. He really wanted to be accountable to others. He believed that this group experience should be familiar to the Indian context, and such a model was available in Hinduism. It was called ashram. Jones writes, and I quote, Without the ashram, I would have lacked a disciplined fellowship. I would have been a lone wolf, an outsider. Now I'm an insider, forced to live out my life in a fellowship of the spirit. Members of the fellowship are responsible to me, and I am responsible to them at a very deep level, at the level of experiential living. The Christian ashram movement took hold in India, and when Jones was stranded in the United States during World War II, he took that opportunity to transplant the Christian ashram to the United States and Canada. My grandfather was always an evangelist and my late father, Bishop James Matthews, often said that E. Stanley Jones was the ablest interpreter of the gospel for the present day of anyone he had ever heard. For Jones, there was no contradiction between being the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament evangelist. Jones became very interested in the integration of body, mind, and spirit, the whole person. He saw the gospel of Jesus Christ enabling fractured and partial persons to become whole persons. He even founded a psychiatric hospital in India and worked with Carl Menninger to get it going, and it is still going. You may now be interested in learning a bit about the relationship between E. Stanley Jones and Gandhi. We have several pieces of correspondence between Gandhi and Jones. In one, Gandhi is asking for Jones to speak out to the British on behalf of India, which he did. Another is Gandhi's response to Jones's evangelistic outreach to Gandhi, who responds, and I quote, my heart is open, but it is a matter of the heart. Then there's a wonderful story about the triangle relationship among East Stanley Jones, Gandhi, and Martin Luther King Jr. Here's the story. My mother tells me of an occasion in Boston when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was at a convocation prior to leaving for Sweden to receive the 1964 Nobel Peace Prize. At the reception following, my mother was introduced to Dr. King and my grandfather was mentioned. Dr. King immediately became very serious and said, your father was a very important person to me for it was his book on Mahatma Gandhi that triggered my use of Gandhi's method of nonviolence as a weapon for our own people's freedom in the United States. And so he did. My grandfather was a highly disciplined person. When in college, he developed the practice of two hours of prayer and meditation daily. Morning and evening, he would just slip away for his hour of devotion, which he later called his listening post where he listened to what God had to say to him. He believed that the strength of his spiritual life was completely dependent 
on the consistency of his prayer life. Up until the age of 87, E. Stanley Jones kept up a rigorous and active life. It is estimated that he preached more than 60,000 sermons, sometimes five to seven times a day. I heard him preach that many times a day. I was tired, he was not. In 1971, after an exciting two months of speaking 154 times in Japan, he had a stroke. After some months in rehabilitation hospitals, he asked to return to India. The doctors concurred. He wrote to us in 1972 that he felt that the year of the stroke was for him the practical application of all that he had been preaching. If he could not preach a sermon, he could be a sermon. When life said no, God still said yes. And such was the affirmation he made in his last book, The Divine Yes. Jones was a prolific writer, writing 27 books. Jones foresaw the great issues and often spoke to them before they were recognized, often resulting in unpopularity, antagonism, and derision to himself. I believe that his writings are relevant and timely for today's world. If I may suggest, you may wanna take a look at the recently reprinted The Christ of the American Road. It reads like it was written yesterday, but it was written in 1940. More than 3.5 million copies of his books have been sold and they've been translated into 30 languages. All proceeds from his books have gone into Christian projects. He was forever helping those in need and literally gave away all that he earned. He would say, I need enough money for my needs and where my needs end, another person's needs begin. And so that money belongs to them. He was a wonderful grandfather and lots of fun. As I was growing up, he spent every Christmas with us and his arrival was a time of great anticipation for he played with us. He particularly loved to swim and watch baseball. He was an excellent athlete and he had a terrific sense of humor. The E. Stanley Jones Foundation is dedicated to preserving and extending the legacy of Jones who blessed millions of people around the world with his preaching, teaching and written works, all proclaiming Jesus is Lord. Our mission is to have all of Jones's books back into print by 2025. We will make it. And now in summary, the legacy of E. Stanley Jones. Jones found the Christian movement scattering its energies about marginal issues of doctrine and denominations and left it centered on Jesus Christ as the one and central issue. Jones found evangelism in America on the edges of the life of the church and not too respectable. And he left it a central issue in the life of all the churches and made it respectable and necessary. He found evangelism largely personal and left it personal and social, a total way of life. He found Christianity presented as alien to human nature and he left it as supernaturally natural and sin as unnatural and alien. He found the kingdom of God largely inward and mystical or futuristic in heaven, and he put it into life now as the one issue now, supplanting all the alternatives of communism and fascism and the like. The kingdom of God on earth and on earth now is the issue. He found the nonviolent, non cooperation movement Indian and Gandhian and left it as the method for finding freedom for the African Americans in America. In concluding, my grandfather would repeatedly affirm that it does not take much of a man or a woman to be a Christian, but it takes all that there is of him or her. It doesn't matter how much you've got, it matters how much God's got of you. God certainly had all of East Stanley Jones and that made all of the difference. Thank you so much.